During assembly, in the last video, I took the Hyundai's head apart to clean out the valve guides and other parts that were contaminated when the old rod bearings failed. I found a lot more wear and tear in it than I did in earlier inspections and I'm really glad I took it apart. The worst thing I found was seven bad exhaust valves, crispy critters with pitted up faces. Clearly they're not sealing like they should and I've done an awful lot of work to make the bottom half of this engine right, so I can't bring myself to bolt it back down without fixing that issue first. I have a good used set of valves from the old GSX build, but in order for any of them to seal right, I also need to do some work to these valve seats. Chances are they're not round anymore, so simply replacing the valves won't be enough to stop them from leaking. But before I get into all that, I have an opportunity to improve other conditions that plague the performance and efficiency of the cylinder head. It's something I said once before that I wasn't ready to do. These are called while you're in there mods, and it's where the majority of time and financial investments originate on your project car. You might find a $12 gasket goes bad, but you spend 10 hours or hundreds of dollars cleaning, repairing, replacing, or improving all of the other parts that it was sandwiched between. I really didn't want to have to do any of what I'm about to go through on this head, but it's already off the car and completely disassembled, so this is the only logical opportunity I will see in its near future. Boosted high compression engines are theoretically prone to knock which is pre-ignition of your fuel source. Knock is relative to the stability of your fuel. As a fuel mixture is compressed, its volatility increases. Excessive carbon buildup or sharp protrusions in the combustion chamber can heat soak or cause hot spots. These hot spots can affect your fuel mixture by prematurely igniting it if its volatility threshold is exceeded under compression. And some fuels are more resistant to this than others, but if this happens prior to your spark plugs firing, or before your engine crosses the top dead center at the top of the compression stroke, it will quickly melt parts and destroy your rotating assembly. Engines with higher compression ratios are more prone to this kind of situation than lower compression engines whenever all other variables remain the same. So in an effort to eliminate these hot spots, to reduce surface area and surface porosity that contributes to heat transfer, I want to produce a smooth, reflective surface that makes carbon harder to stick to it in the first place. So I'll be polishing the combustion chambers of this 1.6 liter head. There are mixed schools of thought on this topic, but it's only mixed because it's a pain in the ass to do it and a lot of people are lazy. Some claim, well, carbon builds up anyway, so it's a waste of time. Well, there are modern ways to deal with that that don't require disassembling the engine, and there's more than enough proof existing already that this works. It may not eliminate knock, but it will improve the burn of your fuel mixture in the combustion chamber. And this leads to higher power output and efficiency as a result of improved timing advance. On this high compression forced induction engine, this process will be more beneficial than it would be on anything else in my driveway. This car has more than a full point higher of a final compression ratio than my GSX. I also have generic cast pistons that will melt more easily than forged pistons will. Knock should kill my engine dead in a heartbeat, so I want to do everything I can to prevent it. Again, I'm doing it while I'm in there. Since it's apart for other reasons already, this job doesn't cost me any more than the shop supplies which I already have. I know how to do it, and my friend Chad won't leave me alone about it. So fine, let's polish the combustion chambers. These tricks don't cost money, they only take time. Your definition of only may vary. What you've watched me do so far is grind out the carbon with a steel wire wheel. Then I moved on to a 120 grit flap wheel. After that, I switched to a finer 240 grit flap wheel. I followed it up with 320 grit wet sanding paper, then 400 grit, then 600 grit. Whenever you polish metal, no matter what sanding media you use, you make two passes, crossing the grain on each pass and you'll produce a better finish. The surface that creates will take less time and effort to polish. For the polishing process, I'm using my Dremel with a flex shaft attachment, felt polishing wheels, and black emery rouge. Black emery rouge is a coarse cutting compound that's very aggressive because it contains an abrasive. It makes short work of dull aluminum parts quickly producing a bright luster, but it will leave fine microscopic scratches on the surface. If you want to completely remove those microscopic scratches, you would follow this up with white diamond rouge on a new clean polishing wheel. Repeat this same process on the other combustion chambers. If you run out of something, go buy more of it before continuing because changing your tooling or techniques from one to the next will yield uneven, inconsistent results. It took about an hour to grind the carbon out of the head. It took an hour to complete the work with the flap wheels. It takes about an hour and a half to sand and polish each combustion chamber. Add another half hour to each one if you want to use the white diamond rouge for a mega bling. 
So what you need to be most aware of is that if you're going to do this yourself, you're going to be here for a while. Either that or you're paying some machinist for 8 to 10 hours of labor not to run a machine that makes him a lot more money than he makes polishing a cylinder head. This is the reason why outsourcing head work is so expensive. It's all about time. Though many machinists may try to talk you out of getting this kind of treatment done to your cylinder head, it's not because there are no performance gains. It's because the hourly rate applied to doing this kind of work yields smaller benefits than many of the machines that they could bill you for running. They may insist that the carbon buildup will negate any positive effects of spending their time here, but carbon buildup doesn't occur immediately. And just like how they make tartar control toothpaste, there are fuel additives and other means of removing carbon from your engine to help your fuel burn cleaner. The NOx suppression characteristics of a polished combustion chamber can be maintained. If there is no benefit in polishing a combustion chamber, then why do the highest performance cylinder heads all have this treatment done to them? This is fairly easy. It just takes water, sandpaper, a rotary tool, a little bit of black rouge, and a few different attachments for the rotary tool. If you've got eight hours to kill and you own these tools already, then everything you see in this entire video will cost you less than 50 bucks in consumable shop supplies. It's really not difficult at all unless you're one of those people who just can't sit still and keep your eyes on the prize. Polishing metal is really a very simple procedure. It's just a specific and a time consuming one. It's unfair for you to watch me do this at this speed because it doesn't do justice for your expectations about how long it's going to take. I'm covering 8 hours worth of work polishing the combustion chambers alone in a little over 7 minutes. The longer you spend on each phase of this job, the better the shine turns out. After you've got some practice at it, it becomes an unconscious habit. I say habit because it really is addictive. Once you realize that you can produce a shine like this all by yourself, you'll never look at metal the same way ever again. You'll start polishing the dumbest crap just because you can. Doing this job is potentially dangerous because this is one of the places where there are practical reasons for doing this kind of technique aside from just the appearance gains. Fortunately, once it's all bolted back together, it won't clash with the unfinished parts inside your engine bay. So not seeing it might remove some of the temptation to polish other things. If for some reason you do enjoy it, don't take pictures of this with your cell phone and go sneak off to look at them or show everybody you know what you did, because then you'll know you have a problem. Speaking of problems, this particular casting is just horrible. I don't think Mitsubishi cared much about the job they did casting these heads for the Hyundai Elantra. I'm pretty sure Hyundai was thrilled with it because it helped them get their automobile brand off the ground back when they couldn't even produce their own engines. But I'm not particularly happy with it. Not at all. Not for how I'm using it. The whole time I spent polishing the combustion chambers left me staring at some pretty unforgivable casting work that's robbing this car of its potential. I took my time on the block to measure and correct its flaws, and the head deserves no less attention. I'm removing the timing cover plates and the intake manifold studs so that I can set the cylinder head upright. These anchor studs are easy to remove with a couple of nuts, and you've seen me do this to remove studs on several other engines already. I'd just like to add that it's nice when you've got an aluminum part and a steel stud because shocking the threads with a little tap of a hammer tends to loosen them up when they get stubborn. The thermostat housing has been an eyesore for several videos now. I really didn't want to take it off and waste a gasket, but it's long overdue to get this thing out of the shot. If I didn't have bad valves, I wouldn't have spent any time doing this at all. I'm leaving all the exhaust studs installed because they let you stand the cylinder head up straight so that you can access the intake ports. And with both of the intake studs out of the way, the cylinder head easily can be set on the milled intake flange, nice and secure to access the exhaust ports. But for most of this job, the cylinder head will sit upside down. Due to the location of the head oil pressure regulator, it needs to be removed if you want this head to sit flat and flush. If you don't, you'll be chasing this thing all over your workbench. Since I have a lot of work invested in making the combustion chamber shine, I'm using painter's tape for multiple reasons here. I need to protect the deck surface and the nice shiny surfaces of the combustion chambers. You know in baseball when you're chasing a pop fly through the outfield looking up, there's a dirt warning track several meters around the outfield fence so that you can feel it with your feet prior to plowing into it. The top half of the valve seat is off limits, and the tape is there to alert me that I'm about to run into the proverbial fence. It lets me judge how close I'm cutting my work in. I'm using a pneumatic die grinder with 80 grit sanding rolls and an extremely short arbor for beginners. Here's a better look at my warning track. It's not much, just two layers of tape. I burnish it around the valve seat so that I can see where the seat starts and ends. It won't stop cutting tools, but it'll take a few seconds to sand through at least, and it'll make it adequate for my needs. But what should really be staring you in the face is that ridiculous looking casting flash on the left hand side. 
you could cut yourself on that thing. Hyundai didn't take the time to remove it. And in 1991, when this thing was cast, probably in a hurry by Mitsubishi, you know, who's, whose fault is it? Blame either one. What you're looking at is lost horsepower. And on a stock engine, it wouldn't make much of a difference. However, I'm pretty sure I'm making about four times what Hyundai ever wanted this head to see. So it would be in my best interest to grind that meteor and the entire casting line down flush. The other parts look a little bit better, but not by much, really. They're all bad. Sadly, these camera angles don't really do this observation much justice. But the bottom and the top of the molds didn't even line up right on this cast, and it left some of the intake dividers lumpy and off-centered. I'll do my best to contour them round and even again, but I currently don't have means of making them match perfectly. I don't have flow testing equipment yet. My goal here is to make common sense improvements to something that's already bad. Just look at the junk under the seats. That's right on the fastest flowing transition into the combustion chamber. That's where all the benefits are in a do-it-yourself port job. It's in the contouring of where the casting meets the machining. For about 20 bucks, you can buy this off the shelf at Harbor Freight. I'm sure you can get a better deal with mail order through someone else, but it comes with a pair of arbors for your die grinder and a 50 sanding roll assortment of cylinders and cone shapes. One's enough to do a stage one port job, but go ahead and get two because you can never have too many 80 grits. I have a personal vendetta against this 20 year old tag on my Dremel. It's blocked too many shots already, so it's gotta go. Doing this work only requires basic safety gear, a dust mask, safety glasses, and gloves. Aluminum can stain your skin, and you don't want to breathe the dust it creates. For a basic do-it-yourself port job, you just start inside the bowls and carefully blend the backs of the seats into the casting of the cylinder head. On the intake side, try to spend more time in the bowl area than on the short radius. On the exhaust side, it's just the opposite. On every one of the ports, spend extra time on the seams along the inside of the runners to ensure a smooth radius. Match that surface all the way around the bowls and try to remove any humps and protrusions that don't appear in all of the other ports. I've got a little bit more to go here because any imperfections that are left in the surface after you're done with the 80 grit will remain throughout all of the other grits that follow. You want all of your shaping completed by the end of this cut. Being consistent from one port to the next is crucial on this job. So if you have to change the shape of something in one port, you have seven more to do. The reasoning for this is that if any one port is larger or flows better than the other ones adjacent to it, it will affect your fuel mixture in that port because it will flow a different amount of air. My goals here aren't to reshape these intake ports. 1G cylinder heads already have gigantic intake ports. None of that is necessary in my case. For the most part, all I'm doing is eliminating the rough cast, blending the seats, and smoothing out the casting lines. There are areas where I'll spend a little more time and I linger to make a little bit more room, but this particular cylinder head will not benefit from enlarging these ports. Since I'm using a small turbo and I'm not installing bigger valves, most of the airflow benefits on my setup will come from the removal of rough textures and outcroppings in the casting. Turbo, camshaft, valve, and intake manifold selection will all play a significant factor in your port job, and it's possible to overdo it on any one of those parts. Bigger isn't always better. Your goal should be to match your valves, cams, head ports, and your turbo's flow rates together or else you'll end up with an inconsistent power band. This car previously made all of its power down low, and my effort here should improve mid-range and high-end output, at least as far as the little 14B turbo that was on it would allow. But as a result of this car being built mostly from stock parts, this one doesn't really need to go very far. I'll save that port job for another day. Right now, I know at least one person is screaming at their computer screen, insisting that I'm doing this wrong. They read somewhere that leaving the surface rough in the intake makes airflow better, and is better for fuel atomization because of the turbulence it creates. While that science has merit, if that were law, then extrude honing wouldn't work. The exact same science states that turbulence slows airflow. I have a different philosophy entirely on this topic, especially for the cylinder head. I don't think rough textures are bad, I just don't believe that it's a one-size-fits-all solution to head porting. It's certainly more beneficial on a carbureted setup to leave the ports rough, but on a fuel-injected setup whose fuel injectors are basically aimed right in front of the backs of the valves, it really won't make much of a difference. It's a fact that a polished surface reduces turbulence and increases flow whether we're talking about air or water. So my own theory is simple, to polish and blend the bowls, but simply leave the rest of the floor rough. It's the short radius side, the shortest distance into the combustion chamber from the intake flange. It's also what the fuel injectors are aimed at. 
For the walls and the roof, I sand them all completely smooth. This makes the long radius the fast radius, and the short radius the slow radius. It should, in theory, create a natural tumbling effect of airflow that doesn't negatively impact fuel atomization. It doesn't permit fuel to pool in the intake, and with three polished surfaces, it should improve the intake port velocity. Port velocity is something that this particular 1G cylinder head with oversized intake ports doesn't know a whole lot about. Here you can see better what I'm talking about. This is what mine looks like after the 80 grit pass is complete. Some light contouring has been done to the dividers and the casting lines are gone. The sides and the roof of the port are smooth and the floor is rough up to the point where the transition into the short radius begins. The reason why I've smoothed the short radius near the valve seat is to encourage the air to turn faster into the combustion chamber when the valves are open. Most people would stop right here at 80 grit on the intake side. Dunskies. That would be fine. You can do that. Most of the benefits of a stage 1 port job have been achieved. I'm not stopping here though. I've left the floor rough and I feel I'd be making better use of the rough floor if the roof and the bowls were sanded to a much smoother finish. That way there's a more drastic difference in the textures and airflow characteristics on opposite sides of the same port. So we're going from the 80 grit sanding rolls to 120 grit and making another pass. It's at this point in time where including the combustion chamber polishing we're at 12 hours of work. We're not even halfway done on the port job. This is where you start asking yourself what kind of a can you just opened on your personal life. You start getting concerned comments on social media wondering if you're okay, your eyes blur, your head grows weary, and you ponder the meaning of life. These things are all normal behaviors. You must accept them, embrace them, and realize the punishment you face now at this point of the job will be rewarded with lots of horsepower if you just suck it up keep your eyes focused where they should be, and always stay continuously aware of where the chuck on your die grinder is. It cuts and gouges a lot faster than the sanding rolls, so you can never be too careful. Not at least when hours of doing the same thing makes these textures and motions blend together in a mind-numbing pounding of your air compressor begging for mercy. This is when you need to relax. By the end of the 120 grit on either the intake or the exhaust ports, your hardest work is really done. You can watch the textures change while using this grit and realize that it takes about a third of the time with each subsequent grit that you had to go through with the 80 grit. I don't use carbides on the intake side because I find them to be far too aggressive and because 1G intake ports don't really need that kind of treatment. Doing your contour work with sanding rolls tends to produce smoother end results. It just takes a bit longer. I think those results versus screwing up are well worth your time. Well, you just, I mean, look at these janks. Man, my life was just made a whole lot easier. Back when I polished my GSX block, nothing like this was available. Finishing abrasive buffs in 180 and 280 grit. It's like a tiny little precision Scotch-Brite pad. And look, they even make purple ones for up to 320 grit. I wish they went up to 480, but you can't beat that. Let's see what these things are all about. Even though these are easy lock for the new style Dremels, I'm using my 22 year old old school Dremel and flex shaft attachment with this ancient screw chuck bit and it's a perfect fit. Another thing that's a perfect fit is an old 4G63 head alignment dowel pin right over the knurled end of my flex shaft to cover up and hide the spinning chuck. This way I can't gouge my work if I tried. You can't beat that either. Man, it's my lucky day. I don't need to listen to my air compressor for several hours. The tool I get to use now weighs 6 pounds less, and after 40 minutes of dremeling to finish all four intake runners, the very first coarse finishing buff finally wears out. These things cost money, but I'm actually surprised at how tough they are. The finish they leave behind has the least amount of machine tracks of any abrasive power tool that I've ever used because these little discs are soft like a sponge. The 180 grit finish looks fantastic. Now we're going to step up to the 280 grit and keep going. My dowel pin trick worked perfectly to obscure the chuck from the part, and if you ever try to do something like this deep inside of a runner, I recommend you also take measures to hide your chuck. Abrasive and cutting rotary tools like to bounce around whenever you're being a dumbass, and in tight spaces it's inevitable that it would touch down and gouge the part. So any metal sleeve that fits tightly around it should protect you. If you have a rotary tool, you already have the tool you need to cut whatever tube or pipe to make one that fits over it, so I don't want to hear any excuses. Looks like the 280 grit lasted through all four runners as well. One pack of those things was all this took. That was less than seven bucks. I think it's worth it. Let's move on to the purple one. Fine. 
As these buffs wear down, their diameter gets smaller and they reach better into the tighter spaces. The harder you press on them, the faster they wear. And oh hey, suddenly it's an hour later and I'm halfway through the rough cut on the bowls. Stuff happens. Sorry you missed 32 seconds. I'll make it up, I promise. I had all kinds of difficulty editing this much video. We're at 15 hours right here. Now what was I saying? Oh yeah. The harder you press on them, the faster they wear, so you're best off getting what you can reach while they're new with light pressure, and then go back to the tight spaces after it's worn down. That way they'll last you longer, you, you get farther with them. Moving on to the medium buff. Blingin', already. These things really do all the work for you. They're just the right size to fit the ports of these heads, and they produce better results than flap wheels. Here we go with the fine one again. So this is what my intake ports look like when I'm done. I removed all the rough cast from everything but the floor. I did a little bit of shaping around the valve guides. I took a little bit of height off the hump, but nothing really radical. I opened up the transitions around the dividers, and I smoothed out the short radius. It sounds like I did a lot, but I don't consider this to be really anything more than a stage one intake port. Now for the exhaust side. Aside from the obvious contrast of what we've been working on for the past 16 hours, What's different here is that the ports are narrower and tighter. The divider is monstrous. On the 1.6 liter non-turbo Elantra head, it's as if there's a thumb right in the middle of every port, but due to the short length of the exhaust runners, they're really easy to work with. These ports are still loaded full of carbon that didn't wash out with the mineral spirits, and it actually helps us see what we're removing right now. Make sure your dust mask is up to snuff. The transition from the seats is really rough and uneven. If I installed a larger turbo than what I have on here right now, there's just no way that these tiny little exhaust ports could keep up with the demand. The one advantage to these exhaust ports being so small is that the escaping gases leave the head with lots of velocity, great for spooling a turbo. I'll be making some changes to help pull the gases out of the combustion chamber and to help move more air at higher boost levels, but first I'm doing something that I didn't do on the intake side. I'm going to use carbides. The one you want to use for this is a single cut burr for aluminum. If I were going to do a big extreme port job on a cylinder head, I'd have a huge collection of these things in different sizes and shapes, but for the kind of port job I'm doing, this is all I need. The first thing I like to do whenever I change up my tooling is to make sure the bit is perfectly centered in the chuck and spins on a true axis at all speeds. Any deflection and I'll end up all over the port. Since the exhaust runners are so short, the studs aren't in my way. This bit happens to have a concave radius, and I'm starting out about as deep as the valve guide. I'm narrowing the divider and preparing it for knife edging. Once again, it's imperative to remove the same amount evenly on both sides of the divider and to repeat it on every port. Next I flip the head around facing the other way so I can ensure that I have the divider even from top to bottom. That's all I'm doing with the carbides. I'll blend it larger with the sanding rolls, but I just want to make a low pressure zone further down the port to help pull exhaust gases through the bowls. Now it's time to blend the seats of the exhaust ports, grind the casting lines, and deburr the bowls. This is the side of the head where you want to spend more time on the contours of the short radius. The reason for this is because of the angle that the air enters and leaves the combustion chamber. Look up the Lovell gas factor if you want to learn more about that swirling effect inside the combustion chamber and how it relates to the airflow efficiency. Sorry gang, lost another 29 seconds there. Brand new tape, defective right out of the box. Now that the bowls are done, let's take a before look at the runner. I've sanded everything I can reach from the combustion chamber side, and now I have to blend it from the exhaust manifold side. This is why I said earlier that you can never have too many 80 grit rolls. While doing this, I will be both raising the roof towards the end of the port, blending it into the long radius of the bowl, and widening the floor just past the divider on the short radius. This is the way I'm going to improve flow capacity without making drastic changes to the diameter of the exhaust ports. Slimming the divider strategically lets me increase the port volume without losing much along the lines of exhaust gas velocity. It's a subtle change that gradually increases just past the bowls, and aside from the small area in front of the divider, that's where all my port shaping ends. So there you go, there's the whole unabridged Hyundai port job secret. The cat's out of the bag. 
A mild head port and polish done to maintain or improve intake and exhaust port velocity. The rest of the job is just smoothing out the entire port, and I'm going to put a nice bling on it, but it's nothing you haven't seen me do in this video already. It's all the same. 80 grit rolls, then 120 grit rolls, inspect your work after every grit to make sure it's even, and then move on. Here's what the stupid exhaust ports look like after the 120 grit is complete. The knife edge is defined and the runners all match. All of my transitions are blended and there's no rough cast left. Just a few divots and holes uncovered because this head is cast apparently from Swiss cheese aluminum. Nothing I can or will do about that except for demonstrate how it will be in the final finish. Once you're happy, move on to the buffs. Coarse, medium, fine. Look, now I'm repeating myself. You see how boring this is? The exhaust ports are smaller, and as a result, you would think that they wouldn't take as long to do. Well, you would be wrong. Unless I'm imagining things, it seemed even harder to smooth out. Maybe it's just because I had a little bit more material to remove on the exhaust side. It still produced a great finish. With the light, you can see that each bowl has a slight little bump just past the seat. This is intentional. The bump is slightly bigger in diameter than the seat is, but I opened the bowl up wider inside the turn just past it. That's where the bores for the seats were machined into the casting, and it's smaller than it was before, but I didn't want to eliminate it completely. I didn't want that much wider than the seat either. I did this because I don't want the exhaust gases to turn too quickly around the seats and swirl in the port right when the valves open. What that hump does is help direct the flow of exhaust gases towards the center of the port. I'm going to blaze through the remaining finishing process because you've seen enough of this already. We're coming up on our 24th hour now and polishing is about to begin. This little section of video is both the 280 and 380 grit buffs. It starts to shine a little bit at the end of the 380, and that's encouraging. The port job is done. I could stop here, but I'm not done yet. You know I always have to give it a little something something to make it a Jaffro original. Well, this one turns into a stage one and a half port job. I'm going to mirror polish these exhaust runners so that the escaping gases have nothing to grab onto. Also, a reflective surface is less capable of transferring heat than a flat one but I'm doing this mostly to make it as smooth as possible. I'm only going to use black rouge because I don't think the extra time with the white rouge will really make any difference at all on this head. I've got a trick up my sleeve to prevent carbon buildup and keep it shiny after I'm done here, but that deserves a whole different video all by itself. I went through about a dozen polishing wheels and spent three hours on the polishing stage to ensure I got into all the little nooks and crannies and put as bright of a finish on this as I can. When you load up the polishing wheel and start applying pressure, rough cast traps the black rouge, giving it a hot adhesive-like quality. The friction and abrasion will push the pile of rouge in front of the wheel and eventually expose bare metal. If you overload the wheel with rouge and it clumps, you can use a knife or another sharp flat piece of metal to clean off the wheel. This scrapes a fresh surface into the felt and helps it pick up the rouge on the part a little bit faster. But remember that it's the rouge on the wheel that gets the most work done on the rough stuff. Sometimes it gets stubborn and keeps building up no matter what you do. Cleaning the wheel helps in this case. Just when you think you've got it finished, give it another pass. Unlike what you see me doing here, try to use a non-abrasive cloth to wipe up the excess rouge. Then admire your handiwork. Quite enough silliness for one video. In the deck tech video, I showed off Mitsubishi's famous crusty castings. This head is the worst case I've handled yet, but I'm almost done fixing almost all of its problems. I just want to remove all the flash from the seams because some of it is famous for blocking oil flow. This head has no shortage of those kinds of problems at all. Inspect all of the oil return galleries for chunks and clean out whatever you find however you can reach it. My carbides aren't long enough to do the oil galleries, and I think they're way too clumsy to be playing with around the deck anyway. I just have a few little details to grind out before I'm done, and with all the casting preparations there's only just a little cleanup to do, and then this thing can get a valve job. Let's take a look at the finished product, shall we? 
I'm really happy with how this turned out. I think this treatment will provide plenty of gains for this high compression small turbo setup. The block is completely assembled and I have a limited amount of time to finish it because of how long this port job took. The difficult and most time consuming part is behind us on this build and I have very few details left to iron out at this point. I'm just as anxious to be working on other projects as you are to see them. I have to confess that this amount of detail will change the direction of this build. I know I said many times that it's going together with the same stock parts, but I found a lot more damage in there than just the valves and the seats. Some of those parts can't even be reused. I apparently got a little bit carried away, and this is the reason why you don't port ahead with a good valve job on it. You're bound to damage a seat while you're porting, even if you covered your chuck, and that's all there is to it. Do your valve job last. Don't resurface the head first. As long as you take precautions like I took in this video and have a steady hand, you'll be able to cut new seats without having to replace them. I might be able to lap valves into this and get them to seal again, but there's some rough spots on some of these seats that lapping is never going to remove and fixing the contact area might require so much lapping that the valves get cupped or the seat grinds too wide to meet spec. That would prevent them from sealing under spring pressure. I don't want a head that's received this much port and polishing work going back together without addressing that first. There are some people who have no desire or need to accept this kind of challenge, and I know that doesn't apply to any of you who are still watching this. If anyone wants their cylinder head ported and polished, the supplies aren't really expensive at all if you're already on the tools. But people who don't have the tools, time, or patience will have to pay someone else near or well above a four-digit price tag to do this kind of work. Some of them might even buy the tools themselves after getting a quote. If you're interested in doing this kind of thing, these tools pay for themselves the first time you do this. And they're useful for so many other things. Just be aware that you can't do a perfect head port job without a flow bench. You can, however, clean up what's there and make improvements without ruining the part. Just take your time, or maybe should I say give your time. There are many who would never attempt this for fear of screwing something up because they have no idea what they're doing. They just haven't seen this video yet. Click the like, favorite, and subscribe buttons to help them find it. I think they'll like it. The whole job's right here in this one video. 30 plus hours of work and a little over 30 minutes. I hope we all leave here today stronger and more powerful in our ability. I know the Hyundai did. I appreciate every last one of you for your time and attention. Until next time, stay tubed.